Maryland's education system was once the strongest in the country, renowned across the country for high test scores, high spending per student, lower class sizes, larger technological capacity in many classrooms, and modern uh, physical environments across the state. This was assisted in part by the Thornton Commission's findings, which were presented in the Bipartisan Resolution, also known by its more formal name, the Bridge to Excellence in Public Schools Act. This resolution set a progressive formula that allotted a proportional amount of funding from the state budget each year in house appropriations to education, which over the following few years saw more and more money being attributed to the school systems. Unfortunately, the system didn't last. In 2007, the stock market crashed, and the Great Recession began. The United States economy bowed into a depression, and all sectors of the economy were affected, from investments to infrastructure and construction, manufacturing, trade, farming, and industry. However, one common thread across all the states was the slashing of budgets that occurred in public schools across the country. Like elsewhere, Maryland was forced to slash its budget for education every consecutive year between 2007 and 2010 to prevent a default of the state's debt. In the following years, Larry Hogan was successively elected to two consecutive terms as the state's governor as a Republican in the most liberal state in the Union. To help bandage the pain being caused by the recession in Maryland's economy, some mild austerity measures were passed by the Republican government, and many welfare systems were changed in line with these new policies. While in the following years, education budgets would generally follow an upwards trend line, the per-pupil student funding needed continued decrease at a proportional rate, and these mild increases simply failed to keep up. Every year since 2007, the deficit in education spending has increased in comparison to the year that had come before. The large deficit that was largely eliminated by the policies put in place by the Thornton Commission has come roaring back, and this deficit has become painfully clear through the results of education studies. The American Education Union's form of ranking each state by their education system and funding formulas saw Maryland's quick rise to the top, as the Thornton policies made Maryland's education system finer than any state in the country. However, after only four academic years of enlarging deficit, Maryland's standings began to slip from a place of undisputed frontrunner status to definitively sinking second-tier status. Not only that, but Maryland's clout and testing scores too has fallen. The advanced placement tests run by the Center for Booking has also seen a successive decline in Maryland's rankings since the beginning of the Great Recession, and again its former first place standing has chipped away, leaving it at its worst point that it's been since the turn of the century. The National Association for Education Placement Services rankings has also seen a steep decline in Maryland's rankings since the Great Recession hit. These examples show that while Maryland had had to cut budgets like most states, it has seen a disproportionately bad result in comparison to other states. One of the most chilling statistics that I personally have looked at is the statistics surrounding student poverty in Maryland. Under the Thornton Plan, student poverty decreased, uh, decreased to only 19% in mid-2006, the lowest in a generation, as wealthier counties like Montgomery County, Howard County, and Baltimore County saw student poverty almost eliminated, and poorer counties like Prince George's and Kent County halved their numbers. Since the Great Recession, student poverty has climbed to staggering percentages. At this current point, nearly half of all students are below the poverty line, and when factoring in students on the cusp of the poverty line, Maryland, one of the richest, wealthiest, and most affluent states in the Union, is now majority low income. One in every two students in our state is living off of incomes not even within the lowest fractions of the middle class. But in early 2020, a solution was proposed to these problems. So let's talk about the Kerwin Commission. The predecessor to Kerwin, which was known as the Thornton Commission, or by its more formal name, the Commission on Education, Finance, Equity, and Excellence in Maryland, was an absolute dream team when it was first crafted up in 2002. The commission's namesake leader and spokesperson, Dr. Alvin Thornton, was the Democratic Rights Advisor in Prince George's County, a post from which he chaired several very important organizations, namely the Citizens for Representative Redistricting, where he helped abolish many gerrymandered maps on the local level that diluted the political power of African Americans, and the Coalition Against Police Brutality, 
who was one of the predecessors to the Baltimore ceasefire and later led the fight against the Freddie Gray affair. His strides in activism had earned him a political career. We had tried and failed several times to run for Congress, but eventually settled as deputing for one of his political mentors, Congressman Conyers, and appointed as a legislative advisor in the United States Department of Labor during President Obama's tenure, where he helped increase power for unions and push higher minimum wage policies into Maryland's mainstream political culture. His political career aside, he was also the provost of Howard University for many years, and he eventually became the chancellor of the University of Maryland, and later the director of Maryland's public university system. His main plan was simple. Under his tenure, the Thornton Commission proposed the following system. Every county would receive local, county, and municipal funds. In other terms, funds not directly allocated by the state government based on size of their population. This meant that larger communities like Annapolis, Frederick, St. Mary's City, and Baltimore City received larger influxes of local funds to meet a certain quota of per people spending in each county. On the other hand, each county would receive state and federal funds based proportionally on their GDP per capita. This strategy was meant to help flatten out income disparities and decrease inequality between school systems by awarding the poorest counties more money than the wealthiest counties. This compromise solution balanced wealth with population, meaning that students in Baltimore, Maryland, which was Maryland's largest city by population, continued to receive large funding boosts, while students in rural and poor Prince George's County also received large amounts of funding. In addition, the Thornton Plan made three major improvements over the previous system. It regularly invited large amounts of tax subsidies from payroll taxes, for example. It was continually advised for the Thornton Panel to keep it up to date. And it was constantly adjusted for inflation to ensure that it did not pile, fall behind at national standards. But where did schools actually receive their funding from? Well, 41% of schools' funding, at least in Maryland, is made up by local funds. This can include teachers' unions and activist groups providing donations to certain schools or programs within schools by bundling measures. It can also include county and municipal legislatures granting the school systems in their respective localities as a cut of the annual spread in the budget. Payroll taxes also contribute a significant amount, and they're collected at the local level before, of course, being handed up to the state for distribution. A further 37% are allocated through state funds. Like on the local level, state legislatures generally grant the education system a cut of the money they allocate every year in the budget. Maryland is no different. The State Department of Education also acts as a body to oversee the allocation of funds, as kind of an oversight task force is given to the Appropriations Subcommittee when they draw up the budget each year. A smaller share, but a share nonetheless, of 4% of education funding is provided by the federal government when Congress divvies up all of the year's taxpayer money and appropriations. Like on the state level, the United States Department of Education also steps in and recommends to Congress to which states and more specifically which programs should get subsidies. As Maryland is a small and wealthy state, it does not receive that much federal funding, but the federal funding it does receive is nonetheless not insignificant. The remainder of funding comes from the private sectors, whether it be fundraisers at schools themselves, or parents donating money to annual funds, HOAs, or companies bundling money for some kind of corporate connection or endorsement. But this funding did not last, and unfortunately, the change in the way schools received their funding as a result of the flowing and ebbing in the economy has completely dated the Thornton system, and caused the need for a replacement in the Kerwin Commission's report. We're going to explore each of these funding sources and how their volume changed before, during, and after the recession, and then take a look at how they work today in 2020. Teachers' unions, although once powerful, saw a large decrease in popularity and clout, as many went belly up during the recession. Post-recession Maryland saw a large block for unions as union power peaked and began to steeply decline, and today teachers' unions no longer have significant influence in the education system. Similarly, activists' groups saw a large wave of insolvency run through their ranks, and their influence over the process has since greatly dimmed. Local budgets saw a huge upward shift in the scope of federal and state government, and the Maryland State Department of Education came to block them with large oversight proposals, which unfortunately led to them weakening in influence and as coming to today, where education is no longer a significant and large focus on most local budgets, as the Chesapeake Bay restoration and infrastructure reimbursement have become a lot more important focuses for most local budgets. 
payroll taxes, too, were something that the state and federal treasury departments took larger influence over, preventing local authorities to do as much as they may want. And short-term austerity was rolled out when Hogan came to power after the recession, and a focus change took place from education to other sectors, like the entertainment industry. State budgets actually did not change an incredible amount, as the Maryland State Assembly took a great deal of effort to retain the Thornton system for a period of time during the recession. However, as many Marylanders will know, Governor Hogan infamously took money from the education sector and put it towards the entertainment industry, specifically casinos and their respective laundering systems. The State Department of Education fell on the sword, and also due to larger oversight as short-term austerity was put in, the focus on the State Department of Education shifted away from the Thornton Commission, which its proceedings had been capped. Congressional budgets, too, saw a larger and greater deal of federal government oversight, as the Obama administration worked hard to combat the recession. And as anti-recession measures were put in, Maryland received less and less funding as Congress used its limited resources to support the stock market and the banking industry. The United States Department of Education oversight problems were similar to Congress's, and after the recession was over, they also shifted their capital away from Maryland, concentrating it in states that needed it more urgently, such as Louisiana, Tennessee, and Missouri. As for donations from parents, during the recession, many parents were also unemployed, and a lack of confidence in the economy made many parents hesitant to donate to schools. Afterwards, this problem only worsened during the increasing wealth gap as a result of austerity. However, in recent years, donations have begun to make a resurgence in education funding. As you can see, most of the previous sources of funding are only dwindling, and increased commitment on behalf of local, state, and federal authorities is needed in order to help us move past this issue and closer to a single taxpayer form of education. That's where the Kerwin Commission came in. It, like the Thornton Commission, can only be described as a dream team. Dr. Kerwin, the director of the Maryland Public University System, and Chancellor Emeritus of the University of Maryland was the namesake of the group, and the senior team of the commission included a vast range of liberals, centrists, and conservatives, with seasoned politicians, experienced corporate officials and lawmakers, and education scientists. Notably, Adrian Jones, one of the leaders of the grouping, is currently the first African-American woman to be elected as the Speaker of the Maryland House of Representatives. Now, we are going to look at the six issues that the Thornton Laws were able to address, but have since worsened, and what the Kerwin team has said on these matters. Funding inequality, an issue that has caused the wealth gap between the richer counties of Maryland, our poorer counties did improve with time under the Thornton Laws, as the Thornton Commission had addressed the issue by awarding larger funds to poor areas. However, during the recession, the distribution of stimulus did not receive such careful placement, and the problem came back, but we have not yet reversed the damage to 2002 levels. Following the recession, this problem did begin to improve as donations came roaring back. Curran proposes to allocate significantly larger proportions of funding to poorer communities, as in Thornton, hoping this time to permanently erase the wealth gap between communities. Inflation causing ruckus in education funding was able to subside during the Thornton years, as funding was adjusted for inflation. However, as Maryland suffered devaluation along with the rest of the country during the recession years, the post-recession economic boom was not able to make up the gap. Crowen recommends that we do something that Thornton didn't do, not only adjust education funds by inflation, but also consult economic experts to allow for a more accurate facts-based allocation system. Excess oversight, which was addressed under Thornton as an independent third party, the commission, worked alongside the political system to allocate funds, came back, as you know, during the recession years where centralization of the budgets occurred as the Federal Reserve and the Department of the Treasury consolidated at a national level. Post-recession, the education funding mechanisms returned to influence under the General Assembly. The Kerwin proposal also suggests that consulting with economic experts can help to curb this problem, as well as the inflation problem, as bringing in a neutral third party can work to lessen oversight, as it did during the Thornton years. The leakage of funds from the education industry to the entertainment one was not a large issue prior to the recession, and during the recession, both industries saw budgets slashed. However, when Hogan came to power, he transferred large swaths of capital over to the casino industry. But under Kerwin, around $3 billion of this money will be transferred back to the education system. 
A large growth in enrollment, which kept the poor people's spending need high and rising, did become more manageable during the Thornton years due to the overall policies of wealth distribution. But during the recession, education budgets were cut, and as we know, student poverty skyrocketed. After the recession, this issue continued to worsen due to the, the General Assembly's failure to increase the cap for ed education funding. But Kerwin proposes to allocate more funds to larger student populations, allowing for per-pupil spending needs to be met in a reasonable time frame. A lack of diversification in funding resources did overall slowly improve under Thornton as the state became more involved in budgets, but as federal oversight ramped up, financial affairs of localities were put into jeopardy, and Hogan's tax policies only worsened this problem at the state level. Corwin proposes to require a two-to-one ratio of state to local funds to minimize the burden of localities carrying the weight of all school funding. The Kerwin Commission's report, titled The Blueprint for Maryland's Future, overall includes three important parts. The first part is detailing the increase of funding for schools. An additional $2 billion of state funds will be allocated to education budgets. These will stem from large capital transfers from the casino industry to education and the state level of inflation adjusting these changes. Funds will also endeavor to meet a higher standard of per-student spending. An additional billion of county funding will go to education budgets, and a large sum of $300 billion will be transferred from federal pockets over to the state. The second part of the blueprint details the distribution of those funds, and how all of these additional funds will be divvied up. Funds will be distributed relatively to even out income disparities. For example, the wealthiest school district, Howard County, will receive a relatively meager $80 million in additional funds while Prince George's County, the poorest and the largest, will receive a whopping $600 million. The last main part of the original blueprint deal was suggestions for how funds can be allocated. Although Kerwin has no real say in how the money is used, they recommend putting money towards renovating schools, increasing the usage of technology by students, and subsidizing new computers, as well as reimbursing the performing arts and extracurricular programs to increase diversification of child activities. Before Maryland's General Assembly was able to vote on the matter, and for future reference, the figures below are members of Governor Hogan's cabinet, the blueprint had to pass through state congressional committee hearings. Dozens of protests occurred across the state urging committees to pass it, including a large rally in Annapolis, which one of my friends and a president of our school student council, Seda Irvin, got to speak at in front of the press. Later, I got the absolute honor to testify with my friends in front of the committees as a member of our school student council with support from some of our friends in the Baltimore Teachers Union. I met a lot of wonderful people there, including social activists, members of teachers unions from across the state, and even several state legislators, and I hope to do it again sometime in the future. After it passed through the state congressional committee, the first reading of the bill failed, as just shy of a majority in the General Assembly supported the motion. 94 were required for passage and 92 were in favor. This was in large part due to the opposition of Republicans to the bill and the abstention of most of Maryland's Blue Dog grouping, who were wary of the impeding coronavirus recession and fearful of the potential effects of economic downturn on the bill. Several more conservative amendments were added, officially known as economic safeguards. These were aimed at ensuring the economy would not be affected by the blueprint in case of a recession. It stated that education aid caps would be decreased in case of an economic crisis looming, and increases in education aid could only occur if inflation rates decreased, meaning that the education rate would stay a little bit less flat than what people were originally anticipated, leading to most of these centrists of both parties switching their vote to in favor. But how does this impending coronavirus recession compare to that of the Great Recession? Well, at the height of the Great Recession, unemployment had reached 9.8% in comparison to the current 15%, and as we have just fallen into this depression, the true scope of unemployment is not really yet known. In both recessions, many businesses were lost, but many are already pointed out that the coronavirus recession has killed off significantly more businesses. In addition, the coronavirus recession has left the state of Maryland with practically no available surplus in the budget for the foreseeable future. Governor Hogan last week vetoed several dozen bills, all surrounding the quality of education in the state. This has quickly drawn him criticism. Among these include the blueprint, but also the annual funding for Maryland's HBCUs, arts and music programs, college readiness apps, and stricter regulations on vaping products for students. 
When you look at the price tags for those bills, the official line on the governor's behalf of vetoing these bills to avoid large shifts of capital at a moment when the economy is already hanging on by a thread seems to be more reasonable. But the governor vetoed them, one of the highest rejections of a bill. For example, he could have postponed the bills by several months until Maryland can pass more stimulus and waited to collaborate with federal groups and request stimulus, but instead vetoed it altogether. But we can overturn the veto is, of course, the largest elephant in the room. The bill passed its second reading with 141 votes out of the General Assembly's 188 votes, and you need 125 votes in order to overturn a veto. So at first glance, it does seem like the numbers are there to narrowly pass the veto. After all, Democrats alone can practically overturn the veto, and most of Maryland's Democratic officials have voiced support for the bill, in addition to several progressive think tanks that Maryland's Democrats rely on. However, the original group that demanded the conservative amendments be added, who are largely centrist and neoliberal and are part of the Ways and Means Committee and the House Appropriations Department, do have the numbers to block overturning of the veto if their demands are not satisfied. Their votes are more or less the swing vote. So while it does look like the veto will pass, if everything is well, this centrist voting bloc must be secured, and at present, it looks like many of the moderate Republicans who voted for the bill are going to back up the governor on this, so it could come down to the wire. What can you do to support the overturning of the veto? Well, first of all, I would like to urge all to repost in one form or another all of these important messages from the Baltimore Teachers Union, each of which voices support for a different aspect of the bill and provides an equally valid reasoning to support the bill as a whole. Post these messages accompanied by some of the hashtags that the Maryland Educators Association has thrown their weight behind to give a sense of solidarity, and I would urge everyone to both go secureeveryaction.com to contact your state legislature and asking them to overturn the veto, and go to bit.ly slash override to sign a petition against the veto. Good luck, everybody.